a scorpion. I get to speak too. Hey, stop it! Why do you keep turning to Rish? I'm gonna have more cool things to say than him. Just because he's Mr. Star Wars guy. Welcome to that catch my goat. Okay, everybody, welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield, and it feels like we've not done this in a long time. Even though for you guys, I'm sure you are sick to death of That Gets My Goat episodes. Yeah, because we didn't do it in a long time, and then we just released it all at once. Okay. <laughs> because that was a long time ago that we did those that marathon. As I'm sure many people went, what the hell are they? They're talking about Good Dinosaur like it hasn't happened yet. And yeah. Finding Dory too. This is weird. <laughs> it was just not possible to release them last year. <laughs> right around the time we were trying to finish that marathon up, I went from part-time to full-time at work. And it was just like, oh, okay, well, I won't be doing that anytime soon. And then in the new year, I, I don't know, I just didn't feel motivated to do it or something. Yeah. But uh, hopefully people still got something out of it, you know. Just because we didn't talk a great deal about Finding Dory. We talked about Finding Dory on a different episode. We did. People can uh, refer to that one. Today we're going to talk about a different movie. We just got out of S Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Do you think people are really going to call it a Star Wars story? Are you going to do all of them at a Star Wars story? I, I think, I mean, it's cool that they use that as like some kind of designation so you know instantly, oh, that's different from The Force Awakens. But yeah, I, I'll probably become very angry at anybody who ever calls it Rogue One, a Star Wars story. The same way as that I do when people say, oh yeah, well, when he died in episode four, I, and I was like, wait, what, who, what was episode four? And then I have to get my abacus out. And then they say, it was called A New Hope. And you're like, wait, what? It, well, it, it, wasn't, it, was, it was called A New Hope, but it wasn't called Episode 4. It was right? called Star Wars. Nobody called it A New Hope or Episode 4. That's my particular pet peeve. You, oh, so you'd rather people call it Episode 4 than no, A New Hope? I'd a New Hope is at least called, a title. I'd rather it was just called Star Wars. Because mm. that's what the movie was. And 20 years later, when they made a sequel to it, oh, okay, well, oh, now we've got to go back and change things around. Or I think it was three years later. Prequel but... to it, sorry, is what I meant to say by uh, that. You can hear the rain that is coming down on the outside of the car. Hmm. And now you can't because it stopped. All right, well, there you go. So this was the first of the non-linear... I don't know. What, they what call them the saga films, the numbered ones. Okay, the non-sagas. This is uh, outside of the common continuity. Uh, well, I guess it's not that. <laughs> that's not That's not true. It's just not part of our regular Skywalker family legacy stories. This one was just a external story. I don't know. A Star Wars story. It was interesting, I thought, because as the, as the show was starting up, I turned to you and I went, oh, what are they going to do with the crawl? Right as we saw the Lucasfilm logo, I said, what are they going to do for the crawl? Because they can't say episode 3B or something, because that's weird. And they just didn't do a crawl. Did that disturb you in any way? Did you go, oh, uh, uh. <gasps> It didn't bother me in the same way that not seeing the 20th Century Fox logo before Force Awakens didn't break my heart. I, you know, I, I didn't know how I'd react, but I just, I didn't react. It's like, okay, it wasn't there. Let's move on. But there were people vocally around me, or maybe it was you, saying, bullshit, man. <laughs> Where's my crawl? Uh, well, I just, Samuel L. Jackson happened to be at our screen. Yeah, he was there <laughs> in his Mace Windu outfit, which uh, wasn't really all that popular. Yeah. It felt weird to me to have no crawl and to not at least, at the very least, have the theme play off the top they show you the lucasfilm logo and then they just straight cut there was no dissolve no anything it was just cut oh there's oh, here's a planet and some stars and a weird kind of bah! kind of chord or something that they hit and then there's a spaceship and we're we're, we're in we're on we're live they had to have decided not to do that to do away with that to do away with the star wars logo and the the main theme 
probably just so it felt different from the very beginning. But do you really want it to feel different? I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They did so many other things to make it not feel different that it seemed pretty weird that they would dispense with all the usual uh, traditions. And we'll get to those things eventually and probably talk for way too long about them. But uh, this is a super nerdy review of this film considering that we're sitting here quibbling over the fact that they didn't do the crawl how many well, people listening going oh come on you nerds <laughs> well yeah, and i'm sure there are other podcasts out there that are even nerdier than we are where it's like okay this is the first of our seven hour rogue one discussion and uh, first we're going to be talking about the uniforms and you're just like oh geez but yeah, I'd like to get something out of the way before we even start talking about the movie. And something that I discussed with you, and I've discussed with anybody who'll listen, <laughs> it's too soon yeah. for a new, another Star Wars movie. As the days got shorter and shorter, and I realized that it was actually going to happen. Because in the past, it's always just like, wow, okay, three years. And you're just like, wow, th- two years have passed. Here we go. Only one year left. Getting close. And with Rogue One, there was never anything like that. Just like, okay, oh, wait, the next movie is going to be called Rogue One. Comes out in nine months. Okay. It's like, oh, hey, trailer's hitting. Comes out in eight months. <sighs> Second trailer's hitting. It's here in five months. Yeah, and... Toys are coming out today. It's here in a month and a half. It it was so fast. This is the first time in history that you've not had to wait, you know, at least three years for a Star Wars movie. The window has always been, you know, three years or more. Or much, much more. And now, I'm not saying that it's diluted the potency of Star Wars, but it's made it a little bit less singular, a little bit less unique, a little bit less... I don't want to say less special, but that's what I'm saying. And I honestly would have appreciated Rogue One more had it come out, like, next summer. Had we had, like, a good year and a half. Because to me, Force Awakens is still new. There's still tons of things I don't know about Force Awakens and have never noticed, and things that I have not discussed about it. And, okay, well, sorry, you had your chance. Now it's Rogue (laughs) One's day. And 20 minutes from now, it's going to be episode 8's day. Have they given us a title for that, or will that come next week? It'll come soon. Yeah, we, we just want Rogue One to have a little bit of time in the spotlight. To bask in its billion-dollar box office. To- but yeah, it's not even been a year since Force Awakens came out. Because you and I are seeing, it on, are seeing Rogue One on the 16th of... No, today is the 15th. Yeah. We're seeing it the night before it came out. And yeah, it was the 18th of December last year when Force Awakens came out. So it's just... a Plus, I know I'm getting older, and with each year I rack up, the years will be smaller. And, and, and you yeah. know... It's because you have, you know, that many more years to compare the length of your year to. So it's no longer half your life. Oh, now you're three. It's a third of your life. And it just keeps shortening and shortening. So now a year is one fortieth of your life. Yeah, I don't know. I th- I think that might be. I mean, I, it feels like a symptom. I was thinking of that as we were in, and I got there late. I, there was a gigantic accident as I was rushing. Well, I wasn't rushing. I should have been able to make it in plenty of time to this film. And I'm coming down the freeway, and there's these little signs that they have up that'll tell you, oh, it'll be approximately five minutes to get to this street. And 15 minutes to get to this street, you know, and it'll give you a couple of streets ahead and tell you, you know, what it's like. And I'm driving along and it's like an hour and 20 minutes before the movie's going to start. And I look up at the sign and it says five minutes to the next street and 45 minutes to the street after that. And I went, oh, crap. That's a lot. I'm not even going to be close to the theater by the time I get through that. I'll never make it. Because it was a long damn way to come all the way down here. So yeah, I had to go all... I I took some side routes and went all the way around. And even though this movie started 40 minutes later than the last one that I've come all the way down here to see with you, I still made it by the skin of my teeth. And I walked in... To the theater, and the trailer they were playing was for Cars 3. And I missed that. 
then right after that they played the trailer for Transformers 6. Is it 6 or 5? I think it's I'm going to say 5. Okay, we'll say 5. And then the trailer after that they played was for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Well, they also played Fast and the Furious 8. Oh, yes, and Fast the and the Fate Furious The of the Furious is eight. I think what they're calling it. Then they played Spider-Man 7. How, how far are we on Spider-Man? There's been this would five. Be this six. Is six. Okay, so damn it. I'm so close. Spider-Man what, 6. What about Power Rangers? And Power Rangers 1 million. No, pa- oh gosh. Sabin's yeah. Power Rangers. <laughs> Whatever. Holy crap. Like, I was, I was late. And I saw that many trailers. I missed some already. And, oh man, I don't know. When I, when I saw all those trailers, I just thought... Hollywood, that's all they do now, you know? It's its just like you were complaining about, the event of everything's going away because it's almost like we're getting an episode of a TV show uh, every week now. It's just like, oh yeah, the next episode of Transformers came out today, and then next week is the next episode of Spider-Man, and then next week is the next episode of Star Wars. I mean, I feel like... Feel like what? I should be rejoicing because all of this crap is basically built for me aside from baby boss and uh power transformers rangers. oh and power rangers transformers should be yeah it's, for you it's, i mean it's, it totally should be for me because those are beloved characters for me yeah and stuff. it should be but it's fucking michael bay so it never will be i mean i should be rejoicing but for, instead i just feel like that it's it's just too much it's uh i i need It's like basketball. I'm not a fan of basketball. And one of the main reasons I don't like basketball very much is because they make a basket about every 10, 15, 20 seconds. So you can't get very excited. You know, it's like maybe a tennis match or something as you watch the ball go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then finally somebody wins and yay! It's But with basketball, it's a two and a half hour process before you get to that somebody finally wins thing as they go back and forth. You know, you can't get too excited about a basket because it's two points out of 100 that they're going to score. So they're going to score 50 more baskets. And I'm just not a fan of it. Possibly because of that? I don't know. I think more because I suck at it. But (laughs) that's almost how I feel with these... Like you're saying, you know, it's only been a year. And you're just like, no, no. I don't feel like it's been enough time. Since the last Star Wars, and hasn't been enough time since, you know, the last Marvel movie, and it hasn't been enough time since the last Power Rangers. (laughs) I know there was no Power Rangers before this, but it hasn't been enough time yet. They should wait ten more years. (laughs) You know, when they, when the Star Trek franchise ground to a halt around 2002, 2003... You know, Nemesis didn't do well. No, people stopped watching Enterprise. Paramount's reasoning was franchise fatigue. They made up this new term that people kicked around for a few years called franchise fatigue. Or, you know, there's just too much Star Trek out there. I didn't feel that way. I was just like, wow, well, no, if it's good, right. I love it. If it's Nemesis, no. It's I, it's, bad I don't, movie fatigue. <laughs> but I feel like maybe we do have franchise fatigue in just that there's so much stuff being thrown at us. Yeah, you and I looked at the posters as we were walking out of Rogue One, and there's a bunch of movies where it's like, oh yeah, I would have seen that. And oh, I never got to see that. And it's like, wow, I shoot. That one's another one that slipped past me too. I just, I, there wasn't enough time to go to see them all. Yeah, and, and we went and did something that we haven't done in a long time, which was yesterday we went and saw a non-franchise film. You and me and one other person. Yeah, there was one other guy. That's the way the movie business is now. You've got two or three weeks to show your film and then nobody comes anymore. But yeah, it was neat to have no idea what I'm expecting, to not know what this is about, to not know anything about it coming in. Uh, We don't do that very often. And I kind of miss it a little bit, I guess. There's other movies like that that... You know, there's that Passengers that's coming up. Yeah, we saw a trailer for that last night, and I wish that I hadn't seen it, because I didn't know anything except for (laughs) Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence are on a spaceship. It's like a sleeper ship, 
and they wake up early and I think they, maybe they fall in love or something. I was just like, wow, okay, that, I'm in guys. You don't need to show me any more. And they showed a lot in the trailer and I still am in. I still want to see yeah, it. Yeah, it looks but really But I would rather have just not seen that trailer and gone to it and been like, oh, wow, I didn't know that there were going to be other people in this movie. And I just thought it might be just those two and the android bartender. And it's not a franchise, and I'd like to see it. Maybe I have franchise fatigue. It's it's not franchise fatigue, as in the way they coined it with Star Wars, where it's just like, oh, we've just seen too much of this franchise. I think it's just there are too many franchises to where I feel like I've got to go see this one, and I've got to go see that one, and I've got to go see that one. I don't get out to see movies very often, despite the fact that we've watched a movie two nights in a row. That is a, a real anomaly. But when I was in college, I would go see something every single week, and sometimes more than once in a week. And sometimes I would go to the movie theater and I'd be like, oh, well, I don't really want to see this or this, but one is a, a, just about to start. All right, I choose this one. And I, I would see stuff that I had no interest in seeing. I saw Ace Ventura When Nature Calls in the first <laughs> run theater. Because Not Pet Detective, but When Nature Calls, the sequel. Well, I mean, <laughs> what I'm saying is I hate Ace Ventura with Pet Detective so much that why would you ever go see the sequel? Why? Exactly, that's You'd what I'm saying. Idiot. But I did. And now it's it's the opposite of that. It's just like, okay, there's these three movies that I'd like to see, but I'm not going to be able to see them. I, I, I'll pick one and that one I'll see. And the others, I just won't get to see. I, I won't, I just, I, I can't, I won't. There, there was a Fast and the Furious 8 trailer. And, and for a second, it's just like, whew, okay, good. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even going to worry about that. I don't care when it comes out. Yeah, that's one that I don't have to plan for or say, oh, should I go see that? I didn't even have to ask the question. I don't know. They, maybe as, as we get older, there'll be fewer and fewer movies where I'll be like, okay, that one is worth the effort. You know, of you fighting traffic and getting off and going around and, and all that stuff to see it, it has to be a special occasion for that much effort to be uh, expended. Yeah. And plus, I know that your wife texted you every four minutes saying, where are you? Where, are, where the <laughs> hell are you? It's just like, well, yeah, I can't do this all the time. It has to be something special. I mean, there's no, to me, there's no franchise as special as Star Wars. It is the franchise mm -hmm. and i would hate for one day it to be yeah another star wars what's this one called yeah oh i forget okay well i'll probably see it you know what i mean i never want star wars to be that yeah i'll probably see it yeah and my fear is yeah every 364 days we have another one I'm just going to be, oh, shoot, when does it stop being the franchise? When does it stop being special? Yeah, you know, it was, this is going way back, but I felt a little bit that way when the prequels came out because, you know, Star Wars was a thing that was of the past and, you know, everybody just kind of looked back on it and they and they liked it and they would talk about it, but there wasn't the the culture of the, super duper geeky Star Wars fan wasn't a thing uh, that was really, you know, it wasn't like Trekkies that later named themselves Trekkers. You know, that was already a fandom that was, you know, already ridiculed at the time for being way too over the top. And <laughs> because I was a Star Wars fan and not a Star Trek fan, I thought I was cooler. <laughs> and then... The prequels came out, and that happened. They, 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 I guess finally everybody had a release for it. And they're like, yes! Finally I can play lightsabers in line while wearing an Obi-Wan costume and a Twi'lek dress uh, and painting myself blue. <laughs> yeah, then I was like, oh, I guess I'm a nerd just like the Star Trek guys. I didn't... I thought I was cooler than Star Trek guys. But... Now you give us a bunch of movies to watch, and and we show it our true colors. I I don't know. <laughs> I'm not even sure why I'm saying this. I've forgotten what the point of my uh, story here was. But I wonder about that. Somebody at work was asking about that. Like, you know, it's uh, when is it going to be too much? When is Star Wars going to lose its luster? Because you've got one coming out every year. Is that going to happen? 
Or are people going to be like, oh yeah, keep them coming. I don't know. Maybe we should talk about the movie, though. Do you think we should? We kind of yeah, haven't, like. and we've been here for a long time, so I don't want to shortchange the movie by only talking about the fact that it's coming out quickly. I don't know. It's hard for me to say in answer to your question, not the whether we should talk about the movie, because I don't <laughs> think that was a real question. But no matter how good it is, it can't help but be less special when they just, you know, there's more and more and more and more. I, I don't know. I mean, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has way more movies than the Star Wars franchise. And uh, I haven't felt that franchise fatigue there yet. But it's coming. Yeah. I mean, really, all we need is, like, two or three stinkers. And then it'll be like, okay, yeah, you guys. Yeah, no, it's, it's like Pixar, you know? Pixar has a movie every year. And for a while, we were just like, oh, keep them coming. And then they said, we're going to do two movies. And we're like, uh-oh. Does that mean we're going to see a drop-off in quality? Which it kind of did mean, because we eventually saw that, and now we're just like, meh, Pixar, whatever. I guess I'll probably go see it, but I don't know. Get around to it, maybe in the dollars, or maybe not. Get a, a couple of uh, Batman versus Supermans. A couple of Man of Steels. And yeah, we'll just be like, meh, I'm not going to watch it. I don't really care. And yeah, that that's probably... Inevitable. Because nobody scores every time. Nobody makes every single basket of those hundred baskets you were complaining about every single time they they shoot. Eventually we're going to see... Well, I mean, but you and I live in a world where there were three bad Star Wars movies. Uh-huh. And it did dilute the franchise. Yeah. Would it you... did make the movies less special and all that, but at the same time, it's enough in the past. That has also been relegated to the past, to the point where whenever I hear people mention the prequels, when, you know, references to the prequels keep coming up, I'm just like, oh, can't, no, guys, can't we just put that away? Can't we pretend that that never happened? How come I'm able to pretend and you guys aren't? Yeah, you were talking about reading the book. Yeah, uh, and... Catalyst, the Rogue One novel. The... It's like a Rogue One prequel novel. That is sort of like leads right into it, and you were just saying it was full of prequel stuff, and you're just like, no, no, that that stuff is non-canonical. <laughs> just pretend that it doesn't exist. But apparently, I mean, there in this movie there was some of that. For example, we had Jimmy Smits in there as Bail Organa because that's what he was in the prequels, and apparently he was still around. And there were a few... Was that guy that went and talked to Darth Vader the first time from the prequels? Like, the weird face. It was almost like a human face, but elephantized or something. Where's a Lord Vader, Director Krennic, has arrived. Oh, yeah, I don't know what that was. Uh, I thought I remember. I mean, yeah, the only prequels characters I thought we saw were Bail Organa and... Young Mon Mothma. Where, where could could you think? Was about Young it? Mon Mothma in prequels? She was in Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. Oh really? I don't remember. I haven't seen that in a long time. As I should. But I, I didn't have a problem with the Bail Organa thing. I don't know. But a, I like Jimmy Smits. Bail and Organa was somebody who existed before prequels, so somebody should have been him. And I, yeah. If anything, he probably should have had more to do. Yeah. In this movie, but. He, he just was on camera for a lot of his scenes. He didn't say anything until one short period, which I thought was strange. And we'll have to talk about this at some point in the future, but a few months ago there were these reshoots on Rogue One, and there were a lot of rumors about what the reshoots were and what were the purpose of the reshoots and why the director of Rogue One didn't direct the reshoots. And maybe we'll never know. What my guess is eventually we will know what got reshot and what didn't. But my stomach says one scene definitely was from the reshoots. And maybe all of the Bail Organa stuff was from the reshoots. I bet there was a contingent of people saying one of the purposes for the reshoots was to make it more of a Star Wars movie with more tie-ins and more stuff that deserves a crawl at the beginning, if you know what I mean. They added in those two guys from uh, the cantina going, Hey, watch what you're doing. And that yes, was the that, reshoot. <laughs> that's something we've got to talk about at some point. But yeah, how much is too much 
of that sort of stuff. I'm going to call that fan service uh -huh. because that I think that that's what that was. And oh gosh, I, please don't think that I thought Rogue One sucked by me saying this. But Rogue One was like really expensive fan fiction. It's like we're going to write a story that takes place in the Star Wars universe and may have our own characters and stuff. And some of them are going to bump into characters that you already know. And it's going to be stuff on the periphery. And, uh, you know, it's like a Luke Skywalker story that I wrote <laughs> where you have to decide, okay, well, how much actual Star Wars stuff are you going to have in here? And it's like, well, me, I couldn't help but have him bump into Ben Kenobi. And, but how much of that is too much? And, okay, so you see those two from the cantina, and you see some other familiar faces as the show goes on, and almost without exception, every time I saw somebody, I'd be like, oh, hey, look! You know, it's like, I, an old friend had come back. Right. But, you run the risk of there just being too much of that, of, thank you, Chewbacca! <laughs> and, and I... Wink, wink! I wonder, because I, I know you and I have discussed ad nauseum that initially in Revenge of the Sith, there was going to be a cameo from a very young Han Solo. I remember seeing like the costume sketches. I don't think they actually cast somebody as boy Han Solo, but they got close enough that they had designed like a costume for him to wear and stuff. And I think he was going to be on Kashyyyk with the Wookiees and somebody, and I guess it's only Lucas because who does he answer to? said, well, eh, that's probably not a good idea. And so that got cut. But you run the risk of, oh, hey, look, there's baby Greedo. <laughs> you know, there's, there's oh, young Han there Solo. There was a baby Greedo, wasn't there? <laughs> well, it was the deleted scene where Anakin is fighting with Greedo and somebody says to Greedo, you know, hey, you're going to have a bad end if you keep up this life. <laughs> That was in Phantom Menace. Uh, but um, wasn't there like a baby Greedo? Yeah, yeah the Warwick Davis That was Davis like their friend? Wald, yeah. He's the very dark things in the prequel. <laughs> yeah, this this show is kind of like uh, Fifty Shades of Grey if it was still about uh, Edward. Wait, what? You might have to elaborate on that. <laughs> well, Fifty Shades of Grey is fan fiction. It's that, Twilight fan That fiction. made it big. So that's what I'm saying. This is... Did, did you get that impression that it, that it was fan fiction, that it was ultimately not necessary? You didn't have to see Rogue One? Yeah, no, it, it's totally that way. I mean, you, obviously you don't have to see anything, but uh, <laughs> it's not part of the story. It's a periphery kind of a thing, which I suppose is what all of the A Star Wars story line will be. Some of the stuff... You know, I kept wondering, where are the Bothans who died for this information? Who are they? And there were parts where I just felt like, this doesn't, uh, doesn't, like when Darth Vader catches the ship that Princess Leia is in, they're pretending like they're on a diplomatic mission, and that she's the senator from Alderaan, or the whatever from Alderaan, and Darth Vader just like, whatever, I'm sorry, but I know better. I know what's going on here, and we're going to tear the ship apart until we find those plans. But that can be what's going on here, because Darth Vader was right there and saw them blast off in the ship and take off, and he's going to just go right after them. I get the feeling that, you know, we're one hyperspace jump away from Tatooine and, and uh, the ejection of C-3PO and his little escape pod with R2-D2. It doesn't feel like it totally fits. Uh, and another thing, those guys that were supposed to be in the cantina were in that city that gets friggin' vaporized by the Death Star. <laughs> so how did they get out of there to make it to the cantina in Tatooine? Because everybody else is dead. Maybe they were on the next ship out before it blew up. I guess that's what we're uh, supposed to believe. Well, Captain Phasma somehow survives. Yeah, does she? Is that so, one I'm, of those things that's confirmed? I'm thinking, well, okay. Dr. Evazan and Ponda Baba both took off right before that thing happened. I don't know. I, we don't know how long they were in their cells and all that stuff. Right. It could have been a while. But but yes, as a periphery story, as a, a its own thing, I did enjoy the movie. And yeah, the, but, but the lady next to me, she was so much more emotionally invested in the movie than I was to the point where every time one of the characters died she'd go oh and then when Diego Luna comes back from the dead 
she went, ah, ah, and she was all happy. And I was just like, oh, but I like it when they die. <laughs> and I know that's... I want more of them to die. That, but I did. I hope they all die. I did. I wanted them to die from the start. I did. I wanted them oh, to die Jesus, before they Oh, Jesus, I can't go any louder. Cast the movie. <laughs> so often, because these are franchises and all that stuff, there are no consequences. You know what I mean? Kylo Ren... General Hux and Captain Phasma all survive from Force Awakens. And you know what I mean? There was just this big badass fight between Rey and Kylo Ren, but there were no consequences at all. Uh-huh. And in a movie like this, where everybody gets killed, I was just like, wow, there were actually consequences. Ow, there were that, wow, people weren't bulletproof and stuff like that. And so every single time one of our characters, our heroic characters died, I was just like, oh... Wow, there there are consequences. This is real. This isn't just, you know, a comic book where you're they're all gonna come back in the next issue. Actually they are. They they've announced Rogue One Two. <laughs> Can you imagine they call it Rogue One Two? <laughs> That would piss me off so much. <laughs> they would just call it Rogue Two. Yeah, it would I mean, be if like they, Ocean's Eleven. If they decided to call it Rogue Two, I would be totally behind that. But Rogue One Two, oh my lord. <laughs> It and was it's like Final Fantasy X-2. Uh, it turns out they all survived. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's something that's... You know, you talked about them all dying, and this person next to you being invested in these characters and wanting them not to die. I didn't get invested in them. And I don't know if it's because there were too many characters, and they didn't weren't able to give them enough service for me to care, or if I'm just a jaded old piece of shit that can't muster any human feeling anymore. But I just didn't get that behind them. And so when they died, I was like, oh, yeah, they probably should die because it's kind of a suicide mission, I guess. Did you feel that way? Did you feel like there wasn't enough development, that there was too many characters, or am I just a piece of Well, yes, you are a piece of But that doesn't mean that there weren't too many characters. I mean, part of the reason I decided to read that Catalyst book was so that I would know who some of these characters are. Uh So that it would mean something. And I I know I've discussed that with uh, everybody who will listen, but I just, I hated not knowing what the First Order was or how long ago Luke went or, you know, who the Knights of Ren were and all that. I just, I hated not knowing any of that stuff. A movie should tell you those things. The Knights of Ren were an offshoot of the Knights who say ni. Okay. I, I, they were the knights who, until recently, yes. said knee. They were now the knights that say icky, 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 patang, patang, patang. All right. And so, I, you know, reading this Catalyst book, you know, I now know who Jin Urso is. I know who Galen Urso is. I know who uh, Lyra Urso and Orson Krennic. And oh, well, what was what was Forrest Whitaker's character's name? He's got a big part in yeah. in the book. Uh, in, His in the name movie. was something like... I can't remember. And he was actually from the Clone Wars cartoon, which Marshall told me. And then I, I said, is that really true? Dick to t- t- type? Oh, he's, he's right. So uh, some of the characters, plus you know all the ones that have action figures, had names to me. And so maybe uh, that made them more individual but uh yeah a lot of them were just cannon fodder they were they were there to die but i liked that so many people died that i just i was i yeah it is cool to see consequences to actions you know we've talked about joss whedon and his penchant for buggery wait his penchant for killing off major characters and causing many tears in members of his audiences I, mean, I think that he has said somewhere that the reason he does this is to, you know, make sure that people know that there are real consequences to his story. It's not a Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where you don't even break a sweat killing everyone. And so, you know, somebody is going to bite it. Yeah, that is, that is uh, one of the really cool things. Spoiler alert, some of them die. No, all Everybody of them die. dies. <laughs> so, even Admiral Reddish, or was, was that it Radish? Name? You said it was Radish. It was but... Radish or Reddish, but he was actually more brownish. 
cheese than reddish. There were a couple of white Mon Calamari, too. Oh, uh, yeah, there oh, were some white ones. The, the advantage of having a story like this, where you know that it's a suicide mission, or, or you, where you just want to show how hard a thing that they achieved was, you can have a happy ending with everybody dead. I mean, that's what we got in Rogue One. That scene where Diego Luna... What's Diego Luna's character's name? I don't know. I'm where uh, Let me say, where Cassian Andor oh, yes. and Jin Erso are on the beach, and the cloud is slowly coming toward them. I was just like, oh, that's really nice. You don't see that a lot. Where it's just like, okay, death is coming, and they're... I mean, maybe they'll get miraculously saved, but I got the impression that they weren't. It's like that Toy Story 3 moment where it's just like, nope, you know, death is coming and let's make peace with it. And let's take this one yeah. moment. And they did. It, it made me think of the end of Deep Impact. Definitely, yes. Where the woman and her dad, was her it, Her father, right? yeah. And they just stand there and here comes the wave. It's almost over. And it's pretty powerful, I think. The, uh, you know, the retconning, where, where you, retroactive continuity, where you go back and say, okay, well, Jin's father deliberately made the Death Star exploitable and all that stuff. I don't know that I really have a problem with that either. I actually kind of like it because otherwise it feels like, oh, come on, like how crappy is this empire that they're going to put a really easily exploitable weakness like this and then nobody saw somehow all the designers missed that they're just like oh yeah, yeah this seems fine seems like a good design and then but, there, but was, Jedi one, still there was one up. nerd with glasses running down the hall in that place he's like wait let me get the emperor on the phone <laughs> it's it's the exhaust port it's got the whole thing will blow yeah, instead, it wasn't just some Poindexter's stupid mistake. It was, you know, uh, a it was sympathizer's a deliberate, sabotage. deliberate sabotage. I like that idea. I thought that was a really good idea. CoverGirl is on a crucial mission. Last year, we brought you six new shades in our Star Wars lipstick collection. This year, a major cosmetics breakthrough is imminent. We need to know how to obtain it. Accentuate your cheekbones with CoverGirl's limited edition Rouge One. If you apply it, what will you become? This is your chance to make a real difference to your face. Are you with me? So, uh, I mean, we, we, we have a couple of options. We can talk about the music, which is usually your forte, and I wouldn't <laughs> mind listening to hear what you have to say about the music. Or we can talk about all of the characters, the cameos, the, the special appearances by the fan service in the film, and, and whether that worked for you or not, or which one you liked and which one you didn't. But, sorry, I'm, I'm going to just turn the wheel right here to talk about this. The first special effect... In this movie, where you and I both went, oh, <laughs> and and you know where I'm going. You you see the back of of Moff Tarkin's head, and you hear his voice, and they deliberately keep him, you know, the light of the camera and all that stuff. And I was just like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if you know they're going to do this the whole time. But then he turns, and it's a full on CG Peter Cushing as Moff Tarkin. And we talked about this a year ago or more where somebody at ILM said they were working on this, on a virtual Peter Cushing, and that, you know, they, were, they had made tremendous strides since the days of Tron Legacy, <laughs> where, if you recall, Jeff Bridges' character just looked so not right. You can't say wrong. It's a step beyond wrong. It's not right. Well... What did you think of, of the yeah, virtual Peter I, Cushing? I, well, I mean, my comment that I made to you right after the scene ended tells you how I felt about it because he said stuff to our director Fennec what was his name was it Krennic Krennic he told him to do something as part of their conversation and when it was over I was like oh shit I don't know what he's just said because we I was so just focused. staring at his face going ah you know I was stuck in that uncanny valley and I couldn't do anything but just stare at his face going no it's it's 
It's the Polar Express! No! Somebody make it stop! Yeah, it just, it wasn't right. It was off, it, it, and it was obvious. And later, it, it just seemed to get worse, because they, you know, at first, yeah, they were just, oh, we'll show the back of his head. And, you know, I, I thought this was going to be the only time we saw him after that scene or something, but instead, no, he's back again and again and again, and he's a major character in this show, and he looks like a zombie version of him. He's, like, so old and awful-looking. I don't know how much that matches the original one or not. I don't know. I, but it just freaked. You know, the way his mouth moved and that kind of stuff. I just couldn't stand it. Well, the special effects. See, I would have said, and I said this to you in the movie. I hate people that talk during the movies, and I do it every once in a while. Yes, and I definitely leaned over and I said, well, I wouldn't have guessed in 2016 that there was something that special effects couldn't do. Yeah, still can't do. But they couldn't do it. It didn't look right. And I wonder how many of the people in that audience were huge Star Wars fans and how many weren't who didn't realize, oh, this is a character from... This is a computer-generated human being replicating someone who's been dead for 20 years. How many of them were just... They were aware that something was wrong. Yeah, they're just man. going, well, that guy's weird-looking. There's something not right Why about is that? he so weird-looking? I don't know why, but I don't like that guy. Yeah, I don't... I, I have to look away. Jeez, they should have got cast somebody else as that guy. And he had so many scenes, as you said, and so much screen time that you know that they spent a ton of time trying to get him right and trying to figure out, trying to break through that barrier of the uncanny, trying to cross the uncanny valley, and they never quite got it. But then we get the last shot of the movie, and I gotta say, it made Grand Moff Tarkin look perfect. <laughs> yeah, I felt the same way. There was nobody in the theater who didn't know who that was supposed to be. And didn't go, uh I don't know. I wonder. I mean, like, as soon as the movie ended, the people behind us went, <gasps> That was so sick. Yeah. That movie was lit. Okay, they didn't say that movie was lit. but That yeah, movie was boff. Boff? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fob backwards. That's how much they loved it. But yeah, the, there were people that were really, really excited that it was Leia. And I would have been if... It had been Leia, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just, I, I... You know, you know what it really made me think of was not, I mean, it was the same deal, but it wasn't Polar Express. It was the Christmas Carol that was made by the same production company. For some reason, I just kept thinking, that looks just like the Scrooge from that, the way their mouths move and they're just... <sighs> but yeah, I totally felt like that. It was some kind of motion capture thing. They must have had somebody acting that part with little white dots all over their face, capturing the motion of their mouths, and then they just covered it up with a CG Leia face. But yeah, I just, those things But Carrie don't Fisher work. is still alive, and she's willing to work for Lucasfilm, so it seems like there were other ways that you could pull that off, especially because that is the final moment of the film. That is what you remember as you walk out. Like, she had the hood on when we saw her from behind. And maybe you don't have her take off the hood. And you just see her hand and you have Carrie Fisher deliver the line or whatever about hope. I think that would have worked better, dude. Do you know what I mean? Because like, then in our minds, we know what young Princess Leia looked like. Uh, yeah, I, that's the way I expected them to do Grand Moff talk and because of the way they introduced him. And they did, yeah, they did the same thing with Leia, where you see her from behind, and you see her from the, just her hand. And then, yeah, oh, wait, no, here's her face. <sighs> and they could have also used just footage they shot in 1976 of young Carrie Fisher and just, like, zoomed in on the eyes or something like that, you know, just a way of getting around it so you don't have to spend, God, what, two or three million dollars on that one shot, probably. At that one shot that didn't work. Yeah, it's definitely not to that point where that stuff works just yet. I remember back in film school, 
them talking about uh, how it was just a matter of time before you start seeing Marilyn Monroe acting in a film again made via CG and uh, Humphrey Bogart, you know, as her co-star, etc. You see a little of that kind of crap going on in like commercials where they'll try and, you know, they'll do a Marilyn Monroe kind of a thing. Like they have that Snickers commercial where it's... Uh, Willem Dafoe. Right, Willem Dafoe in Marilyn Monroe's dress being all pissed off because she hasn't had a Snickers. And then, oh, I feel much better. But yeah, they haven't done much of that. They haven't. I don't know that they've done really any of it in the uh, in the movies. I don't think we'll ever see a day when you'll see Marilyn Monroe and, and Humphrey Bogart starring in a movie. It's just the expense, and then yeah, there's so much that can go wrong. And I, you know, I feel bad. The visual effects supervisor or whatever, if he heard this, he's like, "You don't have any idea how long <laughs> we worked on that." And you know, it's like how I studied. Carrie Fisher's young face to the point where I could no longer be with my wife at night because I, I knew this face better. When I close my eyes, young Princess Leia is all I could see. Princess and, Leia. And I'd, and I, I'd Every say, night. look, I apologize. I know that. With you. But like what they did with Bail Organa, where he's just like, wow, how somehow he's older than the last time we saw him. That worked perfectly. <laughs> yeah, they should do more I, of that. <laughs> sorry. I mean, maybe that's douchey. But, like, the... Uh, the Okay, they, they got the actress that played Mon Mothma in the third one, Revenge of the Sith, and they got Jimmy Smith to be him again, to be Bail Organa again. And, you know, there's that one moment when Mon Mothma says to Bail Organa, you know, it's time to call in that Jedi... And, it, and you know, it's like, you have to find somebody you can trust with this. And he's like, you know, I, oh, the person I'm going to send, I trust her with my life. I was moved by that. I was just yeah. like, oh my gosh. I really was. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Because I knew what he was talking about. I knew right. who he was talking about and all that stuff. And it was tied. It, it, Star Wars is sacred. These are the, the, you know, the legends and myths, the backbone of my morality and he was talking about something, that, the story that I already knew and the characters that I, and I was just like, <gasps> and that's how I should have responded when you see Leia and she says hope at the end. But I was just too distracted by the special effect. I, yeah, it's like my comment about uh, Tarkin. I don't know what he said. He told him to do something, but I wasn't paying any attention. I could not listen to the words because well, I was yeah, just like, they, his mouth looks weird. They were Look, bickering over whether... It's, Krennic would be in charge of the battle station or Tarkin would be in charge of the battle station. And, and that's part of what the book about Catalyst is, is there's so much politics in that book and, and just power struggles and, and how the Republic worked and how the Empire works and things like that, which is sort of interesting, but not really what <laughs> Star Wars is about. Yeah, but and, also not. But yeah, you you saw some of that in Rogue One of the the power struggle with Tarkin and Krennic, and clearly Tarkin just delights in being able to blow up that uh, Scarif planet there at the end because it eliminates his main obstacle in you know being the ruler of the galaxy. There was no emperor in this movie. Yeah, I thought that that was really him. interesting when they went to. Like Lava World or whatever. Geonosis? Was it really Geonosis? No. Oh. What was the name of the Lava World in, in Revenge of the Sith where they had their big final I think it was half called, hour long fight? I think it was called Mustafar. Ah, oh, that's where they were. Mustafar. They were on Mustafar? I'm pretty sure that's where that was. Oh, well, I see, think that, that makes me that like the movie less. To be. But yeah, we went there and I didn't know what we were seeing. I, and there was some kind of white chamber or whatever, and I was like, "What is this?" And I guess it was where Vader sleeps or bathes or yeah, he something. Was in some he was having an oil bath, <laughs> and I was just like, it was going to feel so good. But anyhow, I, sorry, I just I kind of had to talk about the Tarkin thing because I I really like the Moff Tarkin character, and if I had been able to just. Turn off whatever that switch was. Hey, it's and grand just, moth to you. And just believe that it was him. I think I, I would have enjoyed it more. I, but yeah, how I, do you get I, around that? Cast somebody. Somebody who kind of looks like him. And just move on with life. I mean, that 
we we talked about it for a second afterwards. I mean, they've got a young Han Solo movie coming out. You know that they've cast somebody as young Han Solo, right? And we're not gonna get like we did with young Leia and not dead Tarkin. They're not going to CG Harrison Ford into this entire film like they did with this. Why couldn't they just do that? Just get somebody that looks like them. And then you're like, oh, okay, that's the new Leia. Okay, cool. That's, oh, that's the new Tarkin. Yeah, he kind of looks like him. That's good. And you just have him say, oh, Governor Tarkin. Ah. And then you know that that's Tarkin and you don't have to... (laughs) do this uncanny valley crap so that you're just the whole time going Ugh. plus you save Zombie millions of dollars too yeah a dude works so much cheaper than a huge team of people creating a fake dude okay well if, if you wouldn't mind steering the conversation where you'd like it to go <laughs> there's one well, other thing that I'll say at the very end when you feel like it, this conversation has ended but what would you like to talk about? Well, I, mean, I think we should talk about our overall impression of the film and uh, maybe parts that we liked. We've talked a lot about the things that bothered us because we're nitpicky Star Wars nerds. Okay, but sorry. The, movie nerds, Because too, you're I guess. a huge score nerd, <laughs> what did you think of Giacchino's score? Because I have said in the past, and I'll continue to say it, that he is the heir apparent uh-huh. to John Williams, the greatest composer to ever live. And so, yeah, if there's anybody who's going to get the baton after John Williams is gone, it should be Giacchino, or however you say it. It's weird. The guy's been working this long, and I still can't say his name. Yeah, I don't know how you say it. I always said Giacchino, but it's probably not right. It's probably Giacchino. (laughs) That's how you say Giacomo, which starts with the same G-I-A. It does. I don't know. You know, his score didn't stand out to me. It was just kind of there. The stuff that really stood out to me, which was the stuff I was already familiar with, you know, when the closing credits came on and the Star Wars theme finally played, there was a few times where it felt like... Let's call him Michael. Michael. You could tell he was like playing with you know he was like okay this is kind of close to the love theme <laughs> yes but i'm not gonna go into the whole padme anakin love theme i'm gonna pull it off here and then we'll come back close to it again then we'll pull it off you know you could you could hear some what the hell was that noise it was the love theme across the stars from was, episode two Dun-dun. it was the chair right Anyways, yeah, he did that a bunch of times, I thought. You know, that was kind of fun. But for the most part, yeah, it didn't didn't stand out to me as it being anything special. And, I mean, to tell you the truth, I didn't really get into John Williams' score for Force Awakens either. The the stuff that really stood out to me was, again, the stuff that I already knew. And maybe it's because I'm an old bastard that only likes the things that he already knows. Well, you're describing America, too. It's not just old bastards. But, like, they played what I had always considered the Boba Fett theme from Empire Strikes Back when Vader is in that bath or whatever. And I was just like, whoa, I haven't heard this. It was only played once in Empire, and here you guys are playing it. Weird. A lot of times when that would come back, you know, when you hear the, the assault on the Death Star music while x-wings are flying i was just like oh okay well this is deliberately replaying this yeah to evoke you know that feeling that familiarity yeah it felt like you know one of those maybe a pastiche or uh, something like that where you know they're trying to make you feel and think hey this is just like the other stuff that i've also heard in this same universe kind of a thing which is fine i guess it's just the one thing about John Williams scores uh, is there's always one, at least one song um, in every one of those where you're just like, oh yeah, there's another great addition to the to the stuff on the shelf, to whatever, you know, where you can say, oh yeah, this is the song from this movie, and this is the song from this movie, you know, you could point those all out. And yeah, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't see that in this film, so I don't know if I'm dis. And, and you know, it's the first time I've heard it. It wasn't available to listen to beforehand, like I did with Doctor Strange. So there was no way to 
get accustomed to it and then hear it and be like, oh yeah, cool. Well, initially, Alexandre Desplat was the composer for this movie. And Is that really how you say his name? Are you making that up just like you do with Jacques Gino? You're the one that says Jacques Gino. <laughs> His name is actually Desplat. Well, that's how you spell it. <laughs> but he was replaced, and they say it was because of the reshoots. And Gareth Edwards, the director of Rogue One, you know, wasn't able to come back and, and do that. And again, it's like, how is he not able to come back? What do you, what do you have going on that's more... I mean, what? <laughs> what is it you're doing instead? I mean, if you're not in a full body cast, you come back, <laughs> right? But I, I wonder what you think of, you know, would Desplat have done something that you liked better, or would have been different? Is there a, a danger when, you're tr when you revere John Williams and you're trying to channel John Williams and come up with themes that sound... Because there were a lot of sound-alikes in this movie. Yeah. You're just like, oh, you, yeah, that almost sounds like a John Williams You kind of have to, though, you know, when you're stepping into John... You can't just, like... Oh, we're going to do jazz this time around, you know? You you have to do the same kind of style because that's... I mean, it's not just John Williams. That is Star Wars. Dude, a huge part of Star Wars is the music. And you know, we've talked about that and complained endlessly about that with, you know, like the Marvel movies and, and other things where they have such an opportunity to uh, do something great with the music and they just don't. And, you know, we complain about it because growing up, all of the franchises that we revere and love, that was a huge part, was always the music. And a lot of it was because John Williams came up with really memorable stuff. And so you have the, you know, the Raiders March, and you have the Superman March, and you have the Imperial March, and the Ides of March. It's a huge thing of what Star Wars is. And, you know, much less important is a lot of other things in there. You know, they could have totally done without CG Peter Cushing and CG Princess Leia and just cast new people and nobody would have thrown a fit. But if you don't play the Star Wars song at all, people are going to throw a fit. They're like, what the hell? I w I, that wasn't a Star Wars movie. I never heard the theme once. <laughs> You know, when they start doing Indiana Jones here in a couple of years, it's going to be the same thing. You know, you're going to have to hear that song. I think it's a huge mistake that they've made Superman movies without his theme in it. You know, the Superman Returns... They're, they're, they're not Superman movies. <laughs> Superman Returns was wise in the fact that they did use that. And to tell you the truth... That got me in the door to see that movie as much as anything else, was seeing a commercial. I wasn't excited about that movie. It was coming, I was like, uh, eh, it might be cool. And then I saw a commercial where they had Superman flying around, and they were playing that music, and I was like, oh, I gotta see this movie. And I'm getting, like, chills and goosebumps and jizzing in my pants, and it's the whole thing. Just a, you know, an automatic response. I couldn't help it. It's a very powerful tool, music. I mean, it's an, it's it's it gives you an advantage. The right score can make you feel whatever they want you to feel. It's manipulative, but in a good way. And you know, in the same way that like your sense of smell is manipulative. And you're just like, I wasn't hungry before, but holy crap, that smells good. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, it's it's strange that other people don't feel like it's that important of a tool, but. I don't know. There's, you know, I've had lots of people say that John Williams is overrated because, you know, of that. He tells you what you're supposed to feel instead of the movie doing it. I was like, okay. But it got this guy to spend eight fifty on Superman Returns opening weekend. And he wasn't going, want, you know, wanting to. Wouldn't you want to employ that kind of secret weapon from now on? Anyhow, uh, the... so yeah, I mean, that's how I felt about the maybe I'd like it more once I actually hear it a bunch of times. I would like to hear, and I, I imagine since the movie is now out, it's going to be everywhere. You will be able to listen to those again, and maybe you know, the next time I see the movie, I'll recognize, oh, okay, this is Krennic's theme, and oh, Jin has a theme, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the characters had themes that because why wouldn't you do that, right? You learned from the best. Right. I mean, that's one of those things that Williams did all the time. He had a theme for so many things. And you would hear them again and again. 
it's awesome. But yeah, you know, overall, I, I really enjoyed the movie. You know, the other fan service things that we didn't really mention was, you know, they showed a lot of the X-Wing pilots from the Death Star attack scene. Wasn't that weird? Because it was, I think it was the action, they just reused the footage. Yeah, I think they did. And, like, Red Leader uh, worrying about Red 5, I was just like, but Luke is Red 5. <laughs> Not in this run. Did I mention that on the show already? I wanted to see Wedge and Pigs. <laughs> I wondered where Wedge and Pigs are. Yeah, we never did see them. But yeah, we saw a lot of them again. And I didn't... Those ones didn't seem weird. No, they... Uh, they, they I don't think they were CG at all. And uh, we see R2 and 3PO for probably four seconds. They were just standing there in the in the... That was another thing where it felt like things didn't seem right. Because at the start of the movie, they don't know that they're part of the Rebel Alliance, or at least 3 po doesn't. He seem has to. no idea. But at the same time, he says there'll be no escape for the princess this time. And then a few minutes later, he says, "I frankly, I don't know what he's talking about." So maybe he's lying. Three po is lying, I guess, <laughs> or or that's a plot hole, whatever. You, <laughs> you know, a person of some importance, I think. Remember, he's like, who is she? And he pretends he doesn't know, but in the first scene, he's like, there's no escape for the princess this time. Although maybe 3PO didn't know what Leia looked like. I don't know what pr the princess looked like. But yeah, that seemed like another one. You know, it's like the not nearly as bad as the fact that uh, Padme dies before Leia, who said she, you know, knew her mother, but she died when she was very young, so she only remembers a little bit. Things like that where it's like, well, no, no, this doesn't match. That's, I guess, always going to be a problem with a prequel or a side quill. This was a prequel, right? I mean, it was a prequel to Star Wars, to mm -hmm. A New Hope. I mean, it led right into it. Right. Which I thought was interesting. But they, but they never spelled out how far before Star Wars this was and uh, until you get to the end and you realize... And I think that's what a crawl would probably be for, but yeah, that's that's fine. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I the the fact that there wasn't a crawl doesn't ruin it for me, but it just was a little strange. And plus, they'd have like the text telling you what each planet was, uh -huh. and we'd never seen that before in a Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, that wasn't a Star Wars thing before. I didn't dislike it. It did seem like at the at least at the start they were jumping around all over, like here we're now we're at this place, and now we're at this. So place. you think they they felt like shoot this is this is pretty confusing. We've got to let people know somehow. Yeah, that might have been why they went for that because that had, had, they stopped doing that when they went to Fezic Base. What was the name of that planet? Kashik, the one that they blew up at the end. Scarf. Scarif. 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 Scarab Beetle Planet. That one they didn't put a thing up, I don't think. Maybe they did, and I just didn't. But they, they, I think no, they, they didn't, did they? I don't think they put up a, a on, text, on-screen text thing. I think we just they knew for else. that's where they were Don't going, so they didn't need to tell us. Anyways, I, I liked the movie a lot. I thought it was well put together. I liked a lot of the stuff that they did. You know, like we were talking about the whole Death Star uh, Achilles heel that was built in. They, they also made the Death Star really scary. And I thought that that was interesting. You know, like when you see it in the atmosphere and when it shows up, it's like Fudge and Jason Voorhees coming out of the water or something. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, there it is. And yeah, I... I You're dead. Now, I mentioned this as we were leaving. Why did the Death Star only wound planets in this show when it can blast them? They kept saying, oh, just one reactor blast or whatever it was and they just wanted to blow up a city which of course blew up i mean it would it, it, i guess it, it would it, annihilate a whole yeah planet. it ru ruined the world if nothing else it you know destroyed the atmosphere so nobody could live there anymore so yeah they blew up the city but they blew up the planet it's just still there as opposed to being an asteroid belt well my suspicion was they didn't want to contradict what they say in star wars where you know the, the, going to witness the, the test that will make this station operational, you know, and they're, they're still working out the kinks or whatever, but there's there's not really a real reason for that except for, I don't know, I mean, plus it's just so much more dramatic where your characters have a chance to escape because yeah, they're slowly the rumbling. Yeah, slow, 
destruction. Yeah, creeping. as the tidal wave is, is heading toward them. The tsunami, sorry, tidal wave is a uh, incorrect term. Uh, Got nothing to do with tides. <laughs> there. Also, I wanted to mention K2SO. Uh-huh. The, uh, the, the Alan droid. Two dick. The Alan more than one dick voiced. <laughs> I thought he was a pretty likable character. And, I, and yeah, the girl next to me, was she mourned when that guy got killed. And I felt something, too. Yeah, I, thought I, I have the to The way admit. they killed him, because he just took so many hits and he kept trying. And I was just like, wow, that's Yeah, really cool. his death was probably the most noble of them all. And he was also probably the most likable of the the extra characters. Uh, you know, I didn't hate the other characters. I, I liked the Force guy who was like, I am the one with the Force, the Force is the one with me. And, you know, he wasn't bad. He had some good stuff. His little sidekick who spoke a lot less and... Hey, he wasn't little either. Yeah, he was the big... He was the muscle of the of the two. They were okay. They just didn't have enough development for me. You know, they they got to have semi-heroic, you know, at least the blind guy got to have a, a sort of a heroic thing where he just walks through the hail of lasers. That was really neat, I thought. And trips the thing before getting hit. The muscle guy, I expected him to take out a lot more people before he died in the end for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because he had a gun that shot a lot. It was a big gun. He took a lot of people out previous to that, so... I expected when he's finally like, yeah, I'm going up in a freaking hail of bullets. Lock and load, my fuzz. Uh, you know, I figured. But they sort of turned that on its ear by having the first stormtrooper he shoots have a grenade. <laughs> and it's like, whoops. Oh, blam. I thought that was really, you know, that's not something that you see very often. But yeah, I did really like the K2SO. Was it SO? Yeah. I think it was SO. Maybe it was SA. <laughs> I liked his character a fair amount. Uh, he was enjoyable and sarcastic the entire way through. And, yeah, became, uh, you know, had a really noble and uh, heroic death. If a robot can be said to have a death. Well, he did. He saw his little eyes go out. But they can just take him to the factory and replace a few parts and he's back. Probably not. I think that planet was wiped out. Yeah. There's not going to be a Rogue One, two. <laughs> yeah, there is. They're going to have all those people back. <laughs> it's going to be like a little spaceship swooped down and pulled them out real quick, got each one of them, even K2, and they flew away. And then their merry band is going to go on another raid to find out the plans to the new Death Star. Well, that's, see, that's the one where many Bothans died. To bring us this information. And then they're going to go on another adventure to find the plans to the Star Killer base. And then. By then, there'll yeah, be a new Death Star in <laughs> the next episode. Yeah, I'm sure episode 8 will have another one. <laughs> and so will episode 9. Because you can't have a Star Wars movie without a Death Star in it. Otherwise, it would just be a Wars movie. <laughs> Well, I feel like maybe we've reached the end of this episode. I, I did want to talk about the scene that I felt was there for fan service, and it was Darth Vader arrives on the Tantive Four to kill a whole bunch of guys with his lightsaber. Dollars to donuts, that was a reshoot scene mm -hmm. where they said, okay, hey, we, I got an idea for something that's just going to make the fans go crazy, and, and it's utterly unnecessary <laughs> to the film. But, it, oh, my gosh, people are going to love it. And it was cool as hell to see. And, and it's something that you and I have talked about for years, that we longed to see Darth Vader Be hunting Darth, down yeah. the Jedi Knights and, and wiping out the enemies of the Empire and stuff like that, which the, we never see. Yeah, in the first three movies, he's just really imposing is all. He, he's just the menacing guy. He, he's still scary as shit, but he doesn't have to do anything to be that. He just menaces you the whole time you're just like oh my gosh this guy's gonna ah. but it was cool it was pretty neat to see and i know yeah the, the, this guy that i work with actually saw it before me he he came in this morning talking about it and he's like i went and saw it with my kids and and he said when we got in the car my son looks at me and he says daddy 
and then he looked like both ways make sure nobody was going to hear what he was going to say and then he says Darth Vader is the most badass villain ever <laughs> because of that one little scene I mean Darth Vader was barely in it and or James Earl Jones sounds like he's almost dead he you know, did not sound like Darth Vader like Darth Vader sounds forceful and tear this ship apart until you found those plans <laughs> and in this one he's like <sighs> you know the the breath thing was actually James Earl Jones making the breath this time <laughs> like barely able to I don't know man it's well I I liked the scene where Krennic goes and he talks to Vader and Vader chokes him and doesn't even turn around because it's like yeah that's the Vader we know right from the three Star Wars movies we never saw Vader throwing people around and, and lightsabering hundreds of people and all that stuff it, it just he just did this he held his hand up and absorbed the laser right into it. Which was awesome. But yeah, we just never had seen that. And there you go. It was neat to see. Uh, it does sort of feel a little bit like the Yoda lightsaber fight. In which you're just like, oh. But Yoda wasn't like that before. We're seeing Vader be different than he ever was. Which is kind of weird. But yeah, I don't know. It feels like they need to get... A casting call for guys that can do a Darth Vader impression because, I don't know, man, I, I fear for James Earl Jones if he sounds that... that well, terrible. see, I had had that warning because the, he, he voices Vader on the Star Wars Rebels show. And I think I've told you that the first time I heard that, I was just like, wow, the guy they got to do Vader, I mean, he's all right. I can hear Vader in there, but it's definitely not. And then it says, and James Earl Jones. As Darth, I was like, whoa, whoops, sorry. Uh, yeah, he's just an old man. He's he's in his 80s now, mm -hmm. and uh, and it sort of shows. But uh, I will probably see Vader again sometime in one of these Star Wars stories. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but he's still on Rebels. And yeah, in Rebels, the season premiere of season two, Vader sort of sets a trap for all these Rebel ships, and he yeah, he gets in his TIE fighter, and he just goes from ship to ship to ship and kills them all. And I was just like, wow, oh my gosh, this is Darth Vader. And yeah, it's not really something that we saw, although we, I guess we saw it at the end of Star Wars with him taking out X-Wings and stuff like that. But it's just like, yeah, that's Vader was this tremendous pilot, plus he has the dark side of the Force. And so, yeah, just <laughs> he was having people float and he was throwing them around and stuff with the Force. Yeah, just, that was pretty cool. The one guy where he just pushes him up against the roof. And, like, he's stuck to the roof, and then he just kind of, like, drags him along the roof and then flings him against the wall or whatever. Anyway, I just needed to get that off my chest. That There's no way that that was always intended to be part of the film. Um, yeah, but, I think But that's someday we'll find true. out. That's one of the things that, yeah, you were saying is that, you know, the stuff they added in was mo all the Vader stuff, and originally Vader wasn't even a part of it. Who knows? I mean, maybe we'll find out if that's true or not. I uh, think he probably had a very small part. But there's just like, you know, the more Vader we have in this, the more successful the movie will be. And he is the greatest cinematic villain ever. I mean, it's just like, yeah, okay. But a little Vader goes a long way. And uh, I didn't need to see that scene at the end with him. It just did. Yeah, but they didn't overdo it. They, it wasn't they, it super was, CG. It was always a little Vader. Even with this added stuff, he didn't have all that much. He wasn't really much of a part. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I thought this film, it was good. It was well written. It was interesting. Uh, you know, so far, I, I think I liked this one probably better than the last one, The Force Awakens. Not that The Force Awakens was bad, but I think I just had more issues with it than I did with this one. Maybe I'll see the next, the episode eight and get over all those issues as many of the questions are answered and etc. So far, at the very least, I don't think we've had a stinker, a bad one, in, in the two new Star Wars movies that we've gotten so far. So, you know, there's no reason to worry that there's another Star Wars movie next year because uh, we don't have to think, oh, is it going to be as bad as Phantom Menace? Is it going to be as bad as... Attack of the Clones. And each time they say, oh no, this one's actually really good. This one's better than the last one. 
And then you watch it like, no, this one is worse than the last one. So yeah, so far we don't have to worry about the, the franchise fatigue uh, setting in just yet because, yeah, it's, you know, they haven't really let us down with these new ones, I don't think. I'm sure there's tons of stuff that we we have yet to discover in there. Little things where there's aliens and monsters and stuff that we didn't even notice or characters that once you learn their name, you're like, oh, hey, this guy had a bigger part than I thought and stuff like that. that uh, so I do want to see it again and we'll see, uh, you know, how that goes. But uh, we'll be back here again a year from now and then a year after that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be just around the corner. It'll be so much sooner than you think. And we'll probably be back again next week with, or, or the week after, sometime relatively shortly, just with more of that gets my goat. Yes, probably. Why not, right? Yeah. So your mountain is waiting. So uh, get on your way. <laughs> <laughs> I am the, with the force, and the force is with me. Yeah, I am the force, and I am with him. Yes what he said. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. That is really crappy.